Hi, everyone. You're listening to the Engineering Politics Podcast. Today, I'm going to be talking with James from Commutation Construct about a disagreement we have about how to properly define the cultural and political movement we are seeing on the right today. I refer to this movement as conservatism. James refers to this movement as progressive traditionalism. You can decide who describes this movement more accurately and make sure to send us a comment to let us know which descriptor you prefer to use. And as I've said in previous podcasts, these long-form discussions will have no bonus content at the end, but I would still appreciate you joining and subscribing to the Engineering Politics Locals community. You can go to engineeringpolitics.locals.com and become a member for free, or get a subscriber pass for as little as $2 per month, and you can use promo code EPFREE for a three-month free trial of the subscription pass, that's spelled E-P-F-R-E-E, no spaces. I'll go over more of where you can find me and support this content after the show. Also. Make sure to show some support for James from Commutation Construct. You can find James and join his locals community at commutationconstruct.locals.com. If you like the engineering politics locals community, you will love the Commutation Construct locals community as well, so go check them out. All right, let's get this started. This is the Engineering Politics Podcast. Hey everyone, thanks for coming on to the Engineering Pox podcast. You also might be watching this on the Commutation Constructs podcast uh, with James. And I'm having James Darian on again from the Commutation Constructs uh, locals community. Also can find him in a lot of different things. And I'll plug you at the beginning of this podcast. I'll also plug you at the end of the podcast. Uh, but you have been on before. And last time we talked, uh, we talked a little bit about linguistic propaganda and verbal framing all this interesting, cool stuff that I swear you're going to want to go back and listen to. It's podcast number 15, the Engineering Politics Podcast. You can also find it on the Commutation Constructs Locals community, but that is not what we're going to be talking today. And I'm going to give the floor to you, James. What are we going to be talking about today? Today, we're actually going to be talking about a topic I brought up in one of my uh, Construct casts, which is the topic of progressive traditionalism. And this is kind of funny because it's another linguistic topic as we have a bit of a debate here going on as to the naming structures that we should be using for uh, how to refer to things like political ideologies, positionings uh, in relation to the way society works. So uh, this is going to be a fun conversation, I think. Yeah, I definitely agree. Now, even though the context of what we're talking about might be basically the same. Maybe people will find this a bit tedious that we're just changing the definition of uh, an actual, you know, theme, a uh, political ideology. Um, you know, it is important to understand the most concise manner, uh, you know, what your worldview is and you convey it to someone else. So if you tell someone else you're conservative, you know, depending on the news outlets they watch or the, um, the political ideology they already hold, you know, that could mean you're basically, you know, a Hitler advocate or something like that because of what other people tell you about it. But you come at them with, you know, progressive traditionalism, they're going to be like, okay, I don't know anything what that means. So there's a certain advantage to, I think, using a term that might be very accurate, but also a, a less of a known quantity, right? Conservatism has been around for right. a while. The name's been around for a while. I think it's been misused a lot and I'll get into that. But I think uh, the advantage of the way you use, uh, you know, progressive traditionalism, and I'll, I'll give you the floor after this to explain what that is, uh, is an advantage because it's an unknown quantity. It might make people say, okay, what, I don't know what that is. Can you kind of explain to me what you mean by that term? And so I think there's a big advantage of you using it the way you do, but it's also important to accurately describe what it is. So can you tell us what is progressive traditionalism? Right. So a part of this also relates to some conversations I've had, I've had recently because when I've brought up the term conservatism, uh, typically I, I get a response of far right it, from many different people who would even consider themselves centrist or center left. So and w when you have that conversation, well, it be starts becoming about, oh, well, what are you talking about? Because some people are talking about evangelicals. Some people are talking about neo-Nazis. Some people are talking about laissez-faire capitalists there's a whole spectrum to it so i wanted to kind of create my own framework that's designed based more on a uh, a concept that can be understood on a governmental level the way a civic structure is designed so for me i came up, i decided i looked at the terms progressivism and i thought well what if we don't just use progressivism to define far left activists but instead 
look at progressivism as people who are just activistic in general. So that would be the politically active uh, members of your society. And then if we look at conservatism as more of the people who are not necessarily not politically active, but the people who are mostly politically active in a way where they're going to be maintaining the status quo, uh, maybe on one side or the other, they, they don't really like things to be shaken up too much. And if things are being pushed in a side that they agree with, they, they may be willing to give a little more in that direction, but they're still generally not trying to uh, shake the boat, rattle the boat too much with it. So that's an approach that I start to take up, up with my framing. And I was thinking, all right, well, if that's kind of where we're defining uh, the activism side of politics and the way people interact with it, the other side would be the politics themselves, at which point I kind of approach it more on the way a after going through some his, historical studies of empires, I was really thinking, well, there there's a every empire what what people would typically call conservative is typically the tradition the traditional values of whatever that nation state was so i began to think well if you're looking at traditionalism you're kind of looking at the ideals that a nation was built on but the nations don't necessarily live up to their ideals when they're established if you look at the us we were founded on all men being created equal but we didn't really practice it there were a lot of things we didn't practice we, we have the freedom of speech, but we had obscenity laws at the same time. So there are ways in which a, a country can actually progress closer towards the ideals of their founding principles in a way that, uh, that people may not necessarily realize because the principles are not being lived up to. So in that way, you, you're being a progressive, you're being an activist towards some ideal – and it's more the traditional ideal. So that's why I use traditionalism as opposed to conservatism because when I see when I think of traditionalism I think of I think of the ideals that a country is founded on not this is not necessarily the practice that they're using. And I think of uh the progressivism as the uh, as the call to action arm of any side of political motion. So you get uh more traditionalist views going towards the the founding values and then you have people uh, like recently i saw andrew yang make a comment on twitter he was talking about he said the u.s was founded on life liberty and pursuit of happiness uh canada was founded on peace good government and something else as they're equal and when i saw that i'm just like so you're saying you directly oppose or you you think that the core values of canada are better than the core values of america that's how I take that because I see it as – so I see that as a completely non-traditional view because he – there was an, it was an argument against the most core traditional values of the country. So I, I, that's why I, I sort of designed it in a traditional versus non-traditional sort of faction uh, politically. Yeah, that's uh, funny that you throw out the, the good government as your ideal, as your principle. It's like, well, I guess we should all make that our principle, right? I mean, yeah, it's, exactly. It's like – it's like, uh, you know, uh, possibly President-elect Biden's response to the pandemic is I would, uh, I would uh, get rid of it, you know. It's like, oh, I did, never thought of that before. <laughs> oh, it's my like, gosh. Yeah, right. It's like, okay, <laughs> it, that's not a principle. That, that is your ideal outcome, but you can't just say good government is something we build ourselves on. I mean, if your main export is maple syrup, I don't really know, you know, how influential or, or how, how, these, how the uh, principle of good government is going to change or make everything better. Uh, for you or really any of your partners around the world. And, and, and there's a question of what that even means because it, 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 it really just doesn't mean anything. Because good government can mean anything in any different circumstance. If you are in an incredibly dire circumstance, maybe it would be good to have an authoritarian be able to come in and create order out of in, intense chaos. But on the other hand, it, it, maybe it's a good government is small, refined, and uses minimal necessary force uh, as yeah. Jordan Peterson likes to approach uh, topics. Yeah. It's funny that you even bring that up because, uh, you know, a friend and I were just refinishing Well, he, he watched for the first time. This is like my fourth time watching the, the um, game of Thrones series. 
So if you're familiar with it, uh, uh, yep. there, there's a dilemma at the end that, you know, the person who's going to be taking control of the seven kingdoms is saying, okay, I'm good. And that's the reason I must have control. And if I let other people have control, they're going to try to impose their version of good. And, you know, I can't have that because it might not actually be good. You're, you're assuming yeah. that you are the moral arbiter of what is good. And we know as flawed human beings, we, we aren't capable of that. You know, as you kind of said, there are more, there are significantly more efficient ways of, of governance than, you know, a constitutional republic or a democracy. I mean, authoritarianism is the most efficient uh, form of government because you have one person making all the decisions. You know, no if, that, if that one person is Mother Teresa, okay, you, you, your country may have a good time of it for a while, but what comes after is normally the problem or what comes when they have to make a difficult decision that's going to harm more people than it helps. And, and so that's why we we move ourselves away from it. That's why we have checks and balances. And that's why I think, you know, founding principle in America, you know, is significantly better. And that's what makes America so much, so more unique than all the other countries. Exactly. And, and you also have the issue of, uh, of national principle, uh, not necessarily going in line with personal principle. Uh, this is something that was brought up with ACB in her sort of, in her judgment of, um, of for the right to choose. So th there's this argument that uh, she would have to say, like, maybe as a, as a practicing Catholic, she could not, she could not agree with this, but by the law, it is allowed. It is principled in that form. Mm. So there's always kind of these, um, th these back and forth. Uh, and that may not be the best example, but there are times when there's good, that, that's just kind of a general example of because I know there are legal debates about whether or not that actually is legal or should be. But if something's codified in law, there it does there is a potential for there to be personal conflicts with it. Uh, and if you're if you're in a more authoritarian man, like state country, then there's going to end up being hypocrisies in, in most cases because most most people will not have the personal principle to put the country's principles ahead of their own. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so to go back to your, uh, you know, definitions, uh, it's, it's interesting how you kind of weave in and out of the exact same thing that I believe there. I mean, you, you, you are extremely close, but not quite there yet, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, my definition. So you're wrong is what I'm saying. No, yes. um, <laughs> uh, of course. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, the idea that you have principles created by imperfect men, you know, that's, that is a story as old as time that you have something set forth. It's like, this is my ideal standard and I fall short of that standard. We're all sinners. We all miss the mark. Uh, it's guaranteed that we're all going to miss the mark occasionally. So, um, yep. The, the difference there is uh, when you kind of say conservative would be less politically active and, and uh, uh, progressive would be more politically active. And I know you said it's not, you know, the perfect rule. It doesn't mean that there is no political action by a conservative and vice versa. Um, but, but it is interesting because you do see it manifest in the way a, conser a more conservative person, a more progressive person behave. You know, you don't see conservatives grabbing all these uh, levers of power, especially in the media and in, you know, high government positions, because they're like, okay, I see all of this freedom and especially market freedom in the free market. I'm going to use my talents there. I'm going to go out and make money yeah. and I'm not going to just jump ship and go into politics because I don't find the utility in that. Cause I don't, I don't find power in the American government. So I do think it manifests itself in different ways, but I wouldn't necessarily say that, uh, you know, a conservative, the way I would define it, conservative would be less politically active than, um, than a progressive. Now, I'm just going to give you quickly my definitions of how I'd, uh, you know, say conservative versus progressivism. And I think there's kind of a sliding scale between them both, where I would yeah. say, uh, you know, conservatism is the cultural and political movement that conserves founding principle and progressivism is the cultural and political movement that transcends founding principle. Now, you brought up a very, very good point that I was going to bring up too. Um, and that is every country, it, it means something different in every country because every country has different founding principles. And that's yes. very, very important because what you're conserving can be completely different. And this is the reason why, you know, a conservative in America is so drastically different than a conservative in Europe. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, sure. so, I mean, Jordan Peterson did talk uh, a lot about this and, and I went over this at, at, at a large extent with uh, Truman and, and I set off a series of podcasts I've had with them about hierarchies, but to get into it quickly, conservatives Europe in Europe is more likely to conserve the status quo or conserve a hierarchy where a progressive in Europe is more likely to advocate to progress past a, a status quo uh, breakdown or completely tear down some hierarchies in some cases. 
Um, but this is because, you know, the countries in Europe are much older. They're developed during pre-enlightenment period where you had more feudal systems where hierarchies were not based on competency and they're more based on, you know, birthright and, and government connections. So I think you see it a uh, conservative change a bit differently in Europe just because they're conserving more of the status quo. I think closer to the status quo where in America, your founding principles are already different. You could, I guess, say that the America is created uh, to escape that style of government, therefore the the people who who uh, first came to America and established America as its own country were kind of progressives in their own right, correct? You know, oh, they, were, they were trying to change, but also I think you can argue that they were actually conserving religious tradition, and those religious traditions actually uh, led uh, to more clearly explaining the principles that led to the founding of America. And I think that's what's important that we don't see today is something that the founders did not see coming in the future, and this is the kind of the check and balance, or, or really the the uh, changing tide that they did not foresee in today's America is the uh, almost complete rejection of religion and, and that transcending God. Because when you talk about founding principles, again, to explain more clearly what founding principles are in the American context, you know, you're talking about individual liberty, um, religious freedom, cultural preservation, the limited government and the rights given by God were progressive. Uh, you know, principles are going to be more individual security, not individual liberty, uh, transcendence past God, multiculturalism, true democracy via the federal government, and also the right granted by the federal government and not God. Because if you get rid of God, those rights now have to come from something. And that something normally is government. And that's why you can kind of name any kind of thing you want as a right. You know, my, my health care is a right because the government ought to give me that security. And that's why you can see that changing. That's why that'd be a progressive principle, because that really wouldn't fall in line with the individual liberty uh, of the founding fathers. And, and you can also see that um, that in kind of the, the difference between the way people look at rights between uh, what would be considered the right and left in modern American politics, whereas a lot of the, where if, if you if you read the uh, Bill of Rights, it's a it's a series of uh, essentially laws that the government cannot do things. Negative it, rights, yeah. So, so in in that way, it's negative rights, and, and I've gotten in arguments with people about this who are just like, I hate the term negative rights or or, or positive rights. So they, negative. They see it as being propagandists. But the, but the thing is, w when you when you're looking at it, natural rights for people and negative rights for government. The negative rights are, are saying the government cannot do this uh, because people naturally have are, naturally should be allowed to have these things. Um, or naturally should be able to do these things without necessarily the impact of other people. Like, I, I, it doesn't take other people for me to not be uh, illegally searched without a warrant. <laughs> it does mm. not take other people to stop me from talking. Now they don't need to listen but because they might not be there, but I can still use my mouth, I can still use my voice. So that's kind of where the idea of natural rights and negative rights come in. And then when you get to the what people see as progressivism in the modern day, I'm just going to call it leftism for simplicity's sake right now. But when you get to uh, leftism, you will see that there's a lot of talk of the government granting rights. And, and there, there's definitely a disconnect here. There's definitely a, a, a two-movie scenario where some people see it one way, some people see it another, and they're not able to really connect between one another and kind of it's it's almost like it, there's a barrier between them being able to understand or grasp the the way that the other side is thinking and it, the the US was founded on presenting things as negative rights as things people have natural rights that the government must have negative rights to not impose themselves upon um additionally if if you look I, I hate the word i hate the word liberal being the alternative to conservative in the US because the U.S. was founded on liberal princi principles. It was founded on liberalism. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's almost it, – it's basically like saying we have two conservative parties in a way. If you really want to look at it as conservative and liberal, uh, they would essentially be the same thing, which may be how we got into a bit more of a uniparty type of situation for a while. But if you really think about it, the, to be a true liberal is to be – a more traditionally American in a way, because that's what America was founded on. And there's a lot of interesting aspects to what you were saying before too, regarding religion and people, because in, in the original Fed Federalist Papers, it was e either in number one or two, I think it was in number two. Uh, <laughs> I think it was in number two, where uh, it was Publius, so that was John Jay. What, he went on a whole rant 
for about half a paragraph talking about how the U.S. was made up of one people who fought in one bloody war, who all believed one religion, and it was all one, 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 one. And it was this whole message of unity of essentially the U.S. as being from one culture, from one place, as a unified front, which it sounds almost contradictory to the American concept of being a melting pot, because it is, quite frankly. The, the, the principles of the U.S. apply universally, and they can apply to people universally. But I, it seems that a lot of the founders, at least those ones who are working around the Constitution, did not even grasp the fact that because our principles apply so universally, that more people would be coming in to embrace it, uh, at, at least to the extent that it has happened. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to the melting pot, the idea is supposed to be all these different ingredients. You have your carrots, you have your beef, you have whatever you, you put in the melting pot. These are different entities, but when they, once they come in, they become part of one and really they're supposed to adopt the founding principle. So I think the, the melting pot theory is more of, you know, I, I would say the left of the leftism, you know, types, they're going to say multiculturalism is supposed to be in the melting pot. Right. And that looks more like a tossed salad, right? Because there's individual, yeah. you know, these, and, and America does have an overarching culture with subcultures in there. You know, it's not yeah. to say that everyone must rigidly agree to everything, but the founding principle are the things that they're supposed to agree on. They're supposed to agree that uh, you can't just hit someone because they disagree with you. You can't, you know, violate someone's rights just because they. Well, they I don't mean, agree they did have dueling knowledge. back then. Did, well, I mean, they, they were men. That's why. Um, <laughs> uh, but but that is that's kind of progression in a, in a sense that you're progressing toward a more uh, civilized culture, I guess. But it was still yeah. kind of the idea of we have imperfect men creating these principles that they can't themselves uh, hold themselves up to. But I don't think that's the point. The point is like, I have a goal. I'm going to try to reach toward that goal. You want to trend that direction. So, you know, I think that's the, the important part about putting those principles in place. And those principles are not really supposed to change over time. So to maintain themselves and the policy around those principles will change over time. You know, they're going to be pretty loose when every all men are created equal kind of thing. And you start with slaves. It's like, okay, we, we start, we're, we have a starting point here. Let's change over time. And then the, the unfortunate part is it's very slow. It's pretty inefficient. You have a lot of arguing going on. I mean, it's the same thing with the coronavirus today. They're saying, oh, we're finding all these pushbacks in America because this whole federalism deal. And it's like, yeah, it's called a trade-off. Unfortunately, it's a very, very slow process to get everyone in line. It's going to be a cultural movement, not a political one. And, you know, that's how they're going to secure, you know, the, the intended purpose of those principles. It's going to take a while, but they're supposed to trend toward that direction. And I think that's uh, an important part. And that's kind of hard to, when you talk about progressivism, um, you progressing in that direction. But to me, again, when you say progressing, you know, past and, and your, my, my version of progressivism right here is your version of leftism, I think, yeah. where, you know, you're transcending past the principle. You're like, okay, you know, this thing worked for a while, this whole individual liberty thing worked for a while. But, you know, I realize when someone else hoards all this medical supplies, that's going to hurt me in my, you know, pursuit of happiness. And then it kind of falls apart and they're kind of expanding the scope of the original idea uh, to encompass. And, and, and when kind of researching this a little bit more, you know, you go into like the bull moose party when you saw the yeah. progressive party pull away from the Republican party or more, the more conservative party. You know, I think you saw that we're starting to expand the scope and we're no longer conservating or we're, we're thinking we're conserving, conserving founding principle, but in reality, we're kind of transcending it. And we're saying, okay, we're developed enough that we can start protecting people. We can add these extra protections and securities for people um, just because we think, you know, it's time, it's time. We've, we made it, we've progressed far enough and we can kind of transcend, you know, our old selves into this kind of new, um, closer to, to um, you know, this perfect utopia, I think. Yeah, and, and the Bull Moose Party is really interesting because that, that seems to also be kind of a turning point where in America, progressivism did separate itself from conservatism. Uh, and, and this was another part of the- Republicans. I do think it's an important point. I don't think they just separated from conservatives. That goes republicanism. I think that's uh, th that's pretty fair to say, but at the same time, I believe that um, by s separating from republicanism, uh, it ended up becoming more latched to uh, to more left, more non conservative uh, foundations because th there were aspects that 
they ended up really seeming to merge into the Democrat Party afterwards. And you had a lot of non uh, conservative, not non traditional values that began to pop up there. Uh, Woodrow Wilson got into presidency because of the Bull Moose Party. And Thanks. that's where we got the central bank, the IRS, uh, the US sor sort of lay start to lay off of doing tariffs and began to tax their own people. Uh, we switched from a deflating currency to an inflating currency. Um, and I, I believe that even our founders, uh, and I, I, it might be in a Federalist, Federalist paper that I haven't gone to yet, but I've, I've at least heard this before. I, I'm looking to get back into it, where I, I believe one of our founders said that um, inflation is like the enemy of the people because you're making your people poor. Uh, mm. e even though it does promote trade, it, it also it, it prevents your people from being able to build up generational wealth. Because each generation, the wealth is worth less. So, it, it, again, there's there's a lot of give and take, a lot of trade offs here. Uh, ev everything's got an opportunity cost, to put it in economic terms. Mm. Uh, to do some one thing, you got to give up another. But um, but regarding the uh, regarding the so. I, just to I, step I, back real quick, because in case people are listening who don't understand the bull, bull moose party thing, uh, was it 1912 was presidential election where I believe Taft or uh, William Howard Taft was the incumbent, um, and uh, he was looked at as too conservative to, to put it in kind of your terms, too conservative by Theodore Roosevelt, who was once president, um, and then he was he was running against him, made his own what was the Progressive Party, but called Bull Moose because of some comments he made. He was shot in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then made his speech, and he's like, a, "I'm as tough as a bull moose," and I think that's what it got its name from. Oh. Um, <laughs> and and I, I find it funny when doing more research into it that it's Milwaukee of all places. And if you don't follow my podcast, I'm from Wisconsin. I grew up just in North Milwaukee, so I'm like, "Oh, that, that makes sense." And also, the Progressive Party was started by some dude in, in Wisconsin, so that's awesome. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, so. You know, they're they running against each other, uh, basically kind of for the Republican ticket, and then they were in the presidential election running against each other. Uh, Taft and, and uh, Roosevelt split uh, the votes, which put uh, Woodrow Wilson into uh, the presidency, which, like you said, gave us income taxes, Federal Reserve, uh, and, uh, and a racist president. Too. But yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it gave us a lot of things, and I, I see the embrace of many progressive policies that followed in the years right after that to be kind of the way the uh, Democrats at the time courted the progressive party into merging with them, because it it was shortly after this where they did a lot of things like good faith type of uh, moves, where they uh, I I think that was that when women's suffrage happened. Um, I know it was a part uh, during that time because, yeah. um, you know, uh, when Roosevelt was running in the Bull Moose Party, you know, he had something he called the Square Deal, which was uh, the, the ideals in the Square Deal was to prioritize conservation, which he was the big, you know, kind of, he's the guy who yeah. started the, the He was the environmentalist. Uh, parks and, yeah. Um, also a lot of trust busting. And I believe that's why he parted with Taft was the biggest thing because Taft wasn't he was conservative, I would say, compared to to uh, Roosevelt, but I don't know if I would consider him, you know, a strong, ardent conservative because all three of them, uh, Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson, all were started to become. I mean, this was the inception of the interventionalist uh, across the world. I mean, it was South yeah. America; they were sending Carry troops there all stick. the time. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this is where where all that started, and then you kind of saw both parties <laughs> adopt that uh, model. But um, and then strong consumer protection. So. I thought you kind of started to see a bridge between actual conservatism and, you know, let's say the democratic party in this case, that uh, he was the bridge between those. And like you said, with, uh, you know, FDR really bridged the gap who pulled all those progressives in and really ramped up progressive because Woodrow Wilson also had a lot of progressive yeah. policy in there and it was extremely progressive until you compare it to the new deal. And then it was, you know, and, and, and then he, the <laughs> he seems very conservative compared to that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, FDR went straight left and, uh, and there are there are periods in time where in the U.S. history where we get a president at every like I don't know maybe thirty years or so who just really shifts the way that we handle like welfare um, and the such type of deals at least for the past like hundred years or so. So th that's something that I was kind of looking at because we uh, I would say FDR. Um, Johnson did this, and I would say Obama tried to do that to some extent, whether or not 
he he didn't seem he to did be it successful. more culturally i think yeah well, he, culturally he, he, i think he was very successful culturally he was very successful yeah. uh politically he was less successful though uh and you you can see this in uh, the new york times did an article uh that, that was titled the rise of the far right where it was showing obama's uh, administration how the political parties went and it basically went like this where uh if you're watching the video you can see what i'm doing with my hands yep. if you're not you can't uh my left hand right that's gone way over is the democrat party the one that's gone slightly over is the Republican Party. They said that that was the rise of the far right <laughs> mm -hmm. because um, they used the center as being the European center, which right. Europe, again, the left, right, and center of Europe, of European countries and most European countries is very different from what, uh, especially Western Europe, is very different from what uh, the U.S. is. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. I mean, you see these major differences and... and um, you know, it was uh, interesting when you, you bring up progressives uh, coming out of the Republican Party that, I mean, that that you could identify that as the time where there's this huge shift over to larger government. Because it kind of seems now it's, you know, the a Republican ideal, a principle is limited government. It kind of seems like no one believes that anymore. It's like when they right. talk about small government, that just means relatively small compared to what we have now, which is still massive. And it means right. less taxes. It, it, for the, for the yeah. most part, <laughs> it, it doesn't actually and this is my issue with the way conserv conservatism is used uh, in modern times is most conservatives these days or the way they present themselves is essentially less tax sometimes some are pro war some are anti war depending on their feelings about interventionism they can be they can be one or the other uh some people think they can be both uh, it, it, it's a very odd combination be, being Pro uh, gay rights and all and sorts of all sorts of liberty is seen as conservative now, whereas also religious views are seen as conservative now. It, it's a the the conservative side has become incredibly diverse, and I I believe that's because of more so where the status quo has shifted to, whereas mm -hmm. the left now, rather than you were bringing up how progressives tend to go beyond what you see as being the traditional values. I don't necessarily I wouldn't actually frame it in that way because I see I see I see traditional progressives pushing towards the values and I see I see left or non-traditional progressives pulling away in some direction. So if you look at the left today, it, it's more it's it's less about individual individuality and more about the collectives. It's more about more of a focus on uh as yang said good government whatever that means uh mm. and it does depend on the time which is pro which is probably why you see policies shifting back and forth just depending on what's going on which it does make sense to some degree that you would see policies kind of being dependent on what's what the current situation is but at the same time you're seeing that there's a lack of principle in the way that they're interacting because sometimes you don't want necessarily to have the uh, most efficient government for a set thing. The U.S. government was designed to be inefficient on purpose so that no permanent things could be done that would cause long-term damage or at least to hinder the capability of that, which people tend to forget that. People don't really think about that. Uh, progressives also now, they, so they don't see uh, modern progressives, so left, don't really see our founding principles as negative rights. They see them as being imparted by the government. Uh, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of this kind of counter, not superseding the founding principles, but subversion or otherwise just ignorance of the founding principles, sort yeah. of, or just well, an, an aversion to them, I would even say. Yeah. So, well, I, I would say that's why they identify all of these imperfect men setting these principles that you know, supposed to carry us throughout time and trend us in the right direction. They label them as slave holding racists because they want to reject them, that, and I think the, the current um, left model of, of uh, political interaction is to uh, character attack your opponents. That, that seems to be kind of what their thing is. So if you can slander someone as a, a slaveholder or as a racist, you kind of can ignore anything that they're trying to do you know, at the same time, you know, these imperfect people, again, trying to, to create a better world, but still kind of dealing with the, all the imperfections of the current world they live in, um, you know, it was, yep. it was to kind of uh, shift 
uh, and really say kind of what you're saying is, is they're trying to say these, this founding principle is just a bunch of racist people being racist. And now I want to change, we should change the way we view our founding in order to create ourselves a better world, order to transcend it. That's why I would say transcendence. And I think, you know, with our differences in progressive here, um, this is why, you know, I think you and I might be rubbing together on this one because, you know, when you say leftism, like you don't want to put the conservative on the right, progressives on the left. I would argue the right follows conservatism, the left follows progressivism. I think they're split that way. I think the influence doesn't go in the direction of the, the conservatives want to be on the right side and the progressives want to be on the left. I think it's the, the left wants to be progressive and the conservatives or the, the right wants to be conservative. So I think the influence goes the other direction and they follow, you know, those two groups. I I kind of counter this because I know a lot of people who are more left who just kind of want things to sort of be level. Uh, like uh, typically, do they what... self-identify as left, or do they? I mean, that's the problem with left and right. Typ I mean, these are meaningless terms. I think conservative yeah, and progressive I, I are mean, more accurate. Typically, they'll define themselves as liberal, but they use liberal as a as the alternative to conservative, which is what I'm saying. It doesn't yeah. really make sense to necessarily do that in an American context. Be because mm -hmm. the liberal is part of our conservative values. Um, and so you, you have the ones that they want to make it more fair, but they don't necessarily, or they, they have an appeal to fairness, but mm -hmm. they don't necessarily know how to approach it. Uh, and typically they may be supportive of more leftward movements in order to support this fairness that they, that they search for, but they're not necessarily being the activists going out to do it. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's like the people who talk in the bar as opposed to the people who go out and march in the streets. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's kind of, that's kind of how I differentiate it because I'm thinking, because I, I re, as I've said, I, I put conservative in terms of the modern status quo. I essentially see it as the people who maintain the current Overton window, uh, as opposed to really stretching too far in either direction as a, uh, the people who aren't going out into the streets protesting so much as the people who are maybe they're arguing o over a drink in the bar or something along that line along those lines mm. yeah um I mean, yeah there's a bit there where uh if you break down in more um business terms it's kind of the conservatives are the managers and the the progressives are the entrepreneurs Right. Yeah. The conservatives yeah. like to manage. I mean, you actually see this bear out uh, statistically when it when it comes to, uh, I believe it was the righteous mind with Jonathan Haidt that he breaks down uh, the moral foundations theory as to people are kind of born with the sense of where they're going to lean politically because of these mixed bag of characteristics they have that leave them predisposed to one thing or the other. And you can kind of see it in their, you know, their their uh, participation in the workforce as to what positions they take and they're you know conservatives are very very good at managing something and making sure it, it remains efficient or you know whatever it needs to be where the left you see this a lot in silicon valley they're really good at inventing new things i mean i i would say they're really good at just throwing new ideas out there maybe their hit rate on new ideas is like two percent but if you throw enough ideas out there you're going to hit something you know eventually exactly so, and it's good to have those kind of people i think it really balances out and that's why i would say I wouldn't say progressivism is inherently a bad thing. It's actually really good to have that conversation. And that's why when you see a post, kind of like when you say liberals, um, you know, I don't really consider them. Although I would say, you know, go back like five years, I would consider a liberal uh, across the aisle from a conservative, which really now I think you really see this now where the progressives, who I consider the progressives, or what you consider the left has gone so far that your actual liberal, your, your Dave Rubin classical liberal is a right winger now. He's basically conservative. Right. Because right. It's, it's absorbed those people Be, and even libertarians who I, you know, you kind of have the libertarian conservative, which I, I, you know, I see some issues with that. But, um, you know, you're seeing conservatism kind of absorb all these people because the reason I think is because they see founding principles like I like that thing. I don't agree with all the policies that this right wing conservatives want to do. But I don't really think policy is directly tied to, to founding principle. I mean, you can have policy that goes directly against it, but I think you have policy options within, uh, you know, whatever given uh, um, uh, principle that you have. And that's the flexibility of it. It's supposed to be that way in order for you to trend in the right direction. Right. It's just because there is that trending uh, of sort of the scope of the overtime window of what is conservative and what is uh progressive or liberal or what, whatever you, word you want to use to, to define the non-traditional values um 
the the words the specific word doesn't really matter too much as long as you <laughs> really consider what you're, what's being talked about as long as you're able to really realize that um but as, as there is that trend there there is there is that change so i i kind so that's why i framed it in sort of an overton window type of way because you get you get more there there becomes a point where a lot there will come a point where a conservative in the u.s doesn't really care about religion and politics there will come a point where that that is just a matter of fact just as time has become and people who are considered conservative who are considered religious may even or re wanting to get religion in politics may end up becoming more if they become more activistic uh, they would be seen as more being more progressive uh towards traditional values or something like that they, they would be seen uh as something outside of the overtime window and i i, I think they're I think the important thing here is to say, if you look at it in the terms of the Overton window, and you have progressives on one side always pulling to the left, well, there needs to be a counterbalance balancing force pulling to the right, and I don't believe that most conservatives typically have done that for probably a hundred years. Honestly, like you'll you'll get the one offs, but I don't think. Broadly speaking, I, I don't. You don't see the undoing of these pro, of these leftward progressive values that become sort of overbearing and too much. We didn't get Obamacare undone. We didn't get the Federal Reserve undone. We didn't get uh, income taxes undone after Wilson, after Wilson, after Obama, after after the after uh, World War II. We didn't get the New Deal undone. There wasn't that pullback to eliminate these things that went too far, yeah, or, that, I, well, or maybe, may not too far, but went to a place where they needed to be temporarily. Yeah, yeah. So I 100% I agree with you there. Um, uh, and you know, I've written about this, and a lot of people have talked about this. A lot of the who consider themselves the conservatives out there. Uh, you know, I think uh, two that come to mind is. Uh, Andrew Clavin and Jeremy Boring from the Daily Wire, both of them are like, you know, screaming at like, okay, conservatives, you can yell and, and say, I want to conserve my tradition. Normally it comes down to the family, right? Because when they come, when they're talking about some sort of post-election uh, violence and they're trying to paint it as it's just as likely from the right as from the left. And when everyone's like, yeah, no, that's not true because the most violent person on the right normally, and there's outliers, are going to stay in their house and mean like, I'm just going to load up. I'm going to have a whole bunch of guns in here and you dare not come into my house because I'm just protecting me and my family. That's all I'm doing. And it's very insular. And I think that's why yep. you don't see them going out in the culture and actually fighting, you know, on the front lines, but rather they're sitting back and being like, okay, you, you can try to come in as far as you want. But as soon as you open that front door, you know, it's, it's all out and it's not going to end well for you. That's kind of the, the conservative demeanor I think there. Um, and also something else you said and, and something that, uh, you, know, you know, brought back to me. Uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll say this before I move on. Um, when it comes to the Overton window, you know, me and me and Truman had a podcast on this when it comes to, to the different types of, cause there, there are two Overton windows operating right now. There's one that is very, very wide. And what we'd say, and like you say, the Overton window is kind of, I don't know if you'd say controlled by conservatives, but they, they kind of monitor their own Overton window. And if stuff is too far to the right or too far to the left, they kind of shut it out. I would argue uh, the Overton window is completely owned by the progressive side. And that's, I think, the biggest problem we have right now because you can go out into the street and yell, I love Bernie Sanders, and they're going to get you know, a bunch of woohoos out there. You go out in the street and say, I love President Trump. You're going to get punched in the face. Like there's two yeah. different competing Overton windows here. There, are, there is not just one. Um, and one is very, very small for conservatives and the other ones as large as you can. I mean, you, you have AOC who's, who's in government and that's like insane. Like she, uh, I think like I told you this before, she is the best example of why we should have free college because she went to college, got a degree and got nothing out of it. Like she's <laughs> like the best example of it. Um, An economics degree too. Yeah. <laughs> Don't, uh, uh, it that, that's, that says I a bet. lot. Yeah. That says a lot for what our uh, colleges are worth these days. But Who are controlled by who? 
the government. <laughs> yeah. Well, I well, would say more progressives. Progressives, I yeah. Yeah. So but I I think they progressed past what funded, an institution funded by the government. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, for sure. But I, I would argue they progressed what pa past what an institution should be, and now they're saying this is what it ought to be. Uh, not teaching anyone anything, but kind of giving them the right ideas, putting them out in the world, and saying if you complain enough, you'll hopefully get what you want. And I think that's. I think that's kind of a feature of what we're seeing with this, uh, I would say, more corrupt version of progressivism. And, and when we talk about liberalism, I think the reason we see it as opposed to conservatism is because there is a point at which liberalism can break down if you, if you view it incorrectly. And I think this is an incorrect view of liberalism, and it's absolute liberalism. I must be liberal toward everyone. I must accept all ideas, no matter how bad they are, because I, tolerance is my virtue. That's, that is what I care about. But the problem with tolerance is it's not inherently a good thing, but everyone thinks it is. And I would argue the right is much more tolerant than the left is today. But if you tolerate all these ideas, you're going to tolerate intolerant ideas and you're going to let, you know, the bad people into the castle. And that's what you're, you're not supposed to do. And that's what happened. I think through absolute liberalism, they've allowed all these awful ideas to come in unchallenged. And that's why it's corrupted. And I think that's why you, you see this again, a, a bad version of liberalism, because it's not true. You, they're not, because again, when you widen the scope of liberty so far that anyone can do anything, well, you can violate someone else's liberty, right? So liberty is still right. contained within a scope is like, I can, I can swing at your face, but I, once I make contact, that's no longer liberty. I can, you should be drug off to jail then because you're violating my rights. Exactly. So I think that's why you, you have a, a bad picture of what liberalism is. And that's why people will go under the name of liberals who are not liberal whatsoever. My liberty stops when, uh, my liberty stop, stops where your liberty starts. Yes. Kind of. Yeah, the, uh, the, the favored uh, libertarian slogan. Yeah. So uh, th there's a lot to unpack with all of that. Um, but but there is that over embrace of tolerance, and, and tolerance is one of the most ironic things in the uh, in the modern left because there because tolerance has stopped meaning tolerance. Well, when it, it becomes it, a virtue, it's it's something that is not a virtue that became a virtue, and by doing that, you are are making it um, you're making it moral. You're making tolerance a moral claim. If I say tolerance is moral and intolerance is immoral. Okay. Well now I just, I just labeled it, but now you're going to have to tolerate intolerable ideas that actually hurt people that are immoral. And, and by that you kind of have this mixed bag of, okay, this is no longer, yeah. no longer makes sense. But the thing is they don't tolerate things. The modern left doesn't really tolerate things that they don't see as being intolerant. That, well, that, 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 that's well, that the irony. They see like, as intolerant. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the irony is, the, their tolerance has, has led them full circle to a point where they are intolerant because they only exactly. see tolerance as acceptance of all of these values that they have established as being morally right and morally just and anything that does not confirm to those to to their sense of moral justice uh is seen as intolerant so well, for to, them to the, defi me... the definition of tolerance seems to have changed Yes, exactly. The definition has changed. It's, it reminds me of Ibram X. Kendi saying the only way you can eliminate present discrimination is using future discrimination. It's like you're, you're fighting it by, you're fighting fire with fire. You're, you're fighting cancer with more cancer. Instead of, instead of actually curing the cancer, you're like, oh no, let's give him, you know, he's got, uh, uh, you know, she, if she has breast cancer, let's try to give her uh, skin cancer and maybe it'll cure the breast cancer or something like that. You know, it's, it's a yeah. uh, very, uh, backwards way of thinking, but it's it's something that they know will kind of rile up the base and being like, okay, there's these bad ideas out here. Let's use our own bad ideas to fight them. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It, it's chaos. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you have what I would say is is conservatism, progressivism. They're on a scale. You can be somewhere between the two, uh, but they're kind of what I would label the two extremes. When you come or when you say a uh, progressive traditionalism, is there a mere image of that? Is that, is there such thing as conservative non-traditionalism or, or like, what would you say would be opposing it? Conservative non-traditionalism. Uh, that would be so. Yeah. So essentially conservative non-traditionalism would be like, what's a good example. It, it would be essentially that 
so I probably have a friend who would fall well into this. He believes. <laughs> I in just all... made that term up. I just I just made yeah. an opposing term of yours. I don't know if you actually use yeah, that. To me, that's no, no, more I, 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 do. I don't know if that's a thing. But. No, I, I actually do because so conservative non-traditionalism would basically be um, defending the parts of your society that don't necessarily conform towards the ideals, your traditional ideals. Um, and you could see this through the, through essentially the, the, so part of our traditional values actually is our religious base. And I say this as someone who's not very religious, mind you, but our religious foundation is very important to the structure of the U S so someone who would be a non-traditional conservative might be someone who's more atheistic, um, and, and really holds on to the values that aren't necessarily uh, that wouldn't align with the traditional um, the the standard traditional uh, religious values. So uh, the the right to choose, for example, people who people who will talk who will say, "Oh, I I think women should have the right to choose." You you could now. I'm not saying this is fully. A, a great example of something that is traditional or non-traditional, but I'm just using it as an example. Someone who says the right to choose, and then doesn't, but like doesn't go out and advocate for it. I would consider that a conservative non-traditionalist. They, 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 there's a bit of a status quo, and they want to maintain it. That, and they don't, they're not necess, they're not pushing for abortion up until the time of birth, like some of the progressives are doing now. But they're also, but they're not trying to. They're just trying to be like. Okay, we don't want to lose ground, but we're not really trying to gain that much ground either. It, I mean, it, it, doesn't it sound yeah. like anarchi anarchism? Kind of sounds like it per perfectly fit that mold, right? Because uh, you're conser uh, it's almost like you're conserving chaos. I mean, if you if you put these terms more in like a you know a Jordan Peterson esque type thing, you have a balance between order and chaos, and you could argue that maybe uh, you want to conserve the status quo is more conserving order. Right. And then chaos is, is obviously, you know, stuff bouncing back and forth and you can't really, you know, quantify it. So if you want to kind of conserve that chaos to me, that'd be more not knowing as much about anarchism as I probably could, but it seems like that is someone who I would categorize as like more of an anarchist. Who's like, no, let's tear it all down and let's just see what no, happens. No, no, I, I, I would say anarchists are more progressive because I, I because I, I think they're far more active. So like uh, progressive non-traditionalists, you would, name that then yeah Does that makes sense okay yeah that, that would be a progressive non-traditionalist uh so there so you can you can look at it as being four categories you have the conservative traditionalists the progressive you have from right to left you have progressive traditionalists conservative traditionalists conservatives non-traditionalists and then you have progressive non-traditionalists so uh, the progressive traditionalists are going to be the people uh, they're, they're going to be like um they're going to be like uh, Abraham Lincoln w saying, "Hey, we need to free the slaves because all men were created equal." It violates our it violates our principles to have slaves. It's going to be l possibly like Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt saying, uh, "All people are created equal." He he fought for women's rights to some extent, um, it, and he he sees it as as a duty as a religious duty uh, to protect the environment. He, he actually saw conservation. As being a traditional value. Now, whether or not that's in line with the founding documents of the U.S., uh, I, I don't even know that the founding documents of the U.S. really commented on that. But you could see sort of it, how that could be yeah. seen as a traditional view because it, it it's was, that connection it was between man and nature. Yeah, right. Exactly. It was enveloped in the religious notions that Correct. this is all God's creation and you don't want to destroy God's creation, right? So I think right. it, was, it, it was in there, but it wasn't like an explicit pulled out uh, you know, founding principle, I think. Right, right. So that that's going to be more of the traditional progressive, where, where maybe it isn't explicit, maybe it is explicit, but it's not being lived up to in the way that people could potentially see it being lived up to. Mm -hmm. uh, so then you get to the conservative, the conservative traditionalist. Um, this might be someone who shares your same beliefs, where you'll you'll go into a bar, you'll talk about how we need to lower taxes, we need to like. Uh, like uh, goes you go to church on Sunday, you believe your stuff, but you're not going out to uh, all these. You're not going out to all the Trump rallies. You're not going out to all of the um, to all the pro 
all the protests against uh, Planned Parenthood, like progressive traditionalists will go out to protest against Planned Parenthood, for example. Uh, I, I have some family who does that, actually. Uh, extended family, not like my brother or sister or anything, <laughs> but but I, I know people who do that. And the funny thing is uh, that guy, that one family member who 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 gets involved in that, his sister is a complete other way. <laughs> so they're both progressives on the opposite end of the spectrum. But, um, but so that, that's going to be kind of like where, where you're sitting, uh, maybe, uh, or maybe some of your friends are sitting where they're just at, at, at most, they get into bar talk about it, basically. Uh, then you have the conservative non-traditionalists, which are, all right, there are, val there are values that aren't part of our foundation that we think are good and should be, should be incorporated into the way the country runs. There's, there's going to be things that are not – that kind of go against re our religious principles. There are things that kind of go against our founding economic principles. People, maybe they'll, they prefer the mixed economy as, a pro as opposed to a more libertarian one. Um, they maybe um, – the government was designed for security and safety of the nation, but perhaps they don't, they don't really like us having a strong military something like that and again they're they're going to talk to, they're going to talk about it at a bar they're going to talk about it with our friends um but they're they're not really going out and pushing hard for it they're they're not they're not raising a stink about it maybe maybe you'll maybe you'll have some flaming words back and forth but it's not going to lead to any real political change then you have the progressive non-traditionalists those are the ones who are going out marching in the street. That's going to be your Antifa. That's going to be, and it doesn't need to be as extreme as Antifa, mind you. I, I'm using them as an as just an idea. idea if yeah. you haven't heard. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, they are just an idea. But that's that's an extreme example for Antifa, BLM, all of them. But it, it it could be like your Women's March or any of these types of organizations that promote for non traditional values out like to be incorporated into our government essentially so so that's that's the four that's the four part spectrum that i use for my own viewing of this and, and and this is especially done because the line between what is traditional and uh what is traditional tends to be relatively stable for a country what is seen as traditional now you can get now, over time, you can be build up precedent that you could consider to be added into the traditional value, kind of like how courts set precedent over time, and then they fall back on the past precedent uh, rather than traditions change, it. for sure. Yeah, so so you can get like a, you can get kind of additions to it or some slight adjustments, but typically it's going to be generally the same thing. Uh, whereas I see the actual center of the of what is what the conservative people are going to be arguing over as shifting along with whatever the current uh whatever the current uh status quo kind of is what what are you seeing currently with those um uh with those precedents that were mm -hmm. set for modern times so like roe v wade is is a current precedent no one really wants to undo it like there's people who are who say who will want to uh limit it maybe throw it back to the states but they don't really want well, to that just would take... be undoing it though well i mean roe v well, wade yeah. specifically i i want to undo yeah. roe v wade so if i'm your first first person you well know, yeah but but i also wouldn't wonder, but, but i also wouldn't yeah. consider you uh a conser conservative in my view i would consider you more, more of a progressive traditionalist because you, you take the time to go out and make your channel and promote your message, you, you actually lead to more – you're actually doing an effort that would lead to more uh, social political change, whereas your typical person is just kind of sitting back and watching the TV and kind of letting the TV tell them what to think. Yeah. All of you people listening to this podcast, that's you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, <laughs> Hopefully uh, you guys will take a little more action. Hey, comment below. That's going yeah, right. to – hey, there, that's some action. <laughs> This uh, what I think you need to do is whatever that uh, quadrant um, thing is, where it's got uh, you know I think it's progressive, conservative, authoritarian, non-authoritarian, or anti-authoritarian, where you you 
answer 30 questions and it puts your dot somewhere in the quadrant. It looks like you're going to oh, yeah, make one yeah. of those. The, the political compass. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like you got to make one of those. Um, but so I think we're, we're getting to an hour about, uh, and I did want to, to pull a quote from someone who, who's a conservative voice. So William F. Buckley Jr. is known as like the conservative. He's the guy. Uh, so I did want to pull a quote from him to kind of explain his idea of what conservatism is. And, and this doesn't encompass everything, but I think it is a good kind of general statement as to, to what he believes conservatism to be. So he said, I will not concede more power to the state. I'll not be willing to cede more power to anyone, not the state, not General Motors, not the CIO. I will hoard my power like a miser, resisting every effort to drain it away from me. Uh, I will then use my power as I see fit. I mean to live my life an obedient man, but obedient to God, subservient to the wisdom of my ancestors, never to the authority of the political truths arrived at yesterday at the polling booth. That is a program of sorts, is it not? It is certainly a program enough to keep conservatives busy and liberals at bay and the nation free. So to me, when I kind of pull this quote apart, he isn't talking about conserving policy or status quo. He's talking about, you know, limiting centralized power. He's talking about obedience to God rather than obedience to man or obedience to the government so he can right. maintain his rights. So I think, you know, he kind of puts it in a good way that, again, it's a, the conservative versus liberal thing that, that's not quite accurate because I think the liberal kind of points more towards specific policies where conservative points to the ideals that policies can come from. And I think it's really important to kind of, you know, see how conservatism has changed over time because, you know, this is a while ago back in the 60s probably. Uh, I know my idea of con uh, conservatism has changed in the last like five years. Uh, you know, I kind of give my story about not voting for President Trump in 2016 because he did not fit the conservative demeanor of a, a Mitt Romney or a, a John McCain or a George W. Bush that we had come before. And then by the time, normally, like I always say, I had more of my political awakening when it comes to conservatism uh, between when election day in 2016 to his inauguration, you know, at the beginning of 2017, because I saw awful uh, the, the media was to them and all the, the slander against them and trying to get him basically impeached before he ever took office. And I know this yeah. kind of happened with President Bush too, but I was too young to, to see that happening. Um, you know, I've switched it from wanting someone who's conservative in demeanor, someone who's got the, all the characteristics that I want to being like, is someone going to conserve the principles that give me my freedom, uh, my, my liberty, the, the, the way I, I can exercise my traditions in the way I want to, as long as I'm not harming someone else, I can, uh, you know, worship the God uh, who I want in, in the fashion that I please again, as long as I'm not hurting anyone uh, and, and understand that the, you know, I'm not going to trade in my Liberty for some uh, blank check of security coming from the government. So I think it's important to understand it in that way. So um, yeah. I guess with that, what do you think of kind of William F. Buckley's uh, idea of conservatism here? Or again, how, how it's different in the way that you look at it. Uh, so, Listening to how he talks about conservatism, it sounds, it seems to me like it's very much value based. Um, though, I I I tend to see values as being flexible over time. That that's how we say what it means to be a uh, conservative now is not what it meant five ten years ago. Um, so that's kind of why I've developed this system. Design it basically designed around the Overton window as to how I view. Uh, view conservatism as well as general policy in the u.s or policy just with, within a nation uh instead of having it be really quadrant based it, in my measure it it, it it actually is more like a line uh with sec that's a segmented line so that's kind of how i separate it in my mind uh just just to kind of be more adaptive and aware, I think it's I think it's also important to note sort of it, it it's important to note the principles of the matter. And, and while while I see the value in what he's what he's laid out in his definition of conservatism, I don't I don't necessarily see it being centered around the most core principles so much as it's centered around values. So I, I, I see a bit of a difference there between sort of how I would approach the topic as opposed to him. Yeah, that makes that's, sense. Yeah, uh, that, that's I, just kind of an approach. 
Yeah, yeah. And and I could see where your value kind of judgment comes in as opposed to principle, but I, I would argue these values are derived from the principle kind of thing, but you'd have to go into more context, yeah. I think, of yeah. what he's talking about in order to get there. Yeah, I, I I would definitely say they're derived from principle, but I wouldn't necessarily but I wouldn't necessarily say they fall into principle and therefore because they're value based it's more value based, it becomes more subjective to the uh sways of time, essentially. Good. All right. Well, we're approaching an hour now. Uh, so my final argument to, to end this debate here is honestly, it doesn't really matter what you call it. It doesn't matter <laughs> what you call it. Uh, conservative, progressive traditionalism. Um, the important thing is to understand, I, I think we both agree, understand the founding principle that made this country what it is now. Uh, understand when people look at founding principle and try to say, oh, because it was created by racist white men, it must be invalid for some reason. Uh, understand that, uh, you know, if you want to maintain something like individual liberty, you cannot just trade it in uh, for security and expect, you know, the government to maintain this liberty, because I think it's important to understand the difference between liberty and freedom. Liberty can be taken away, freedom can be granted. There are kind of two opposing things, uh, two opposing sides of the same coin, if you will. Um, but I do think it's, you know, important to, to do your own research and understand, you know, look into more, uh, educational podcasts or, uh, you know, online classes, you know, Liberty university, there's a couple of places that give some free online classes, go to commutation constructs and listen to your podcast. And all the information you're doing is really, really good. You know, come to mind, go to Truman's. There's a whole bunch of people who, who give really good, solid information on this. Um, but I think something important that you hit on when, when coming to your, uh, definition here is being politically active as opposed to being so passive. Uh, nothing is going yeah. to, to whether you want it to change, nothing's going to change or nothing's going to uh, maintain your principles if you are not out there saying or explaining to other people why you want this one thing conserved. So, you know, be more politically active, participate in grassroots movements. This is, this has been the one very bright spot uh, of uh, conservative movements is these grassroots uh, kind of, um, active activating the base to to really show uh you know how people are enthused about uh maintaining their their uh you know rights and, and wanting to make sure that we we keep the checks and balances in in place keep this inefficient government going i know it's really hard to say yeah. that to a group of people and being like no no we want it to be inefficient you know people are like saying get rid of the electoral college like no this is not something you just want to get rid of wholesale there's a reason for it and that that begins yeah. with education. And so what the important thing is, and something you need to understand is the, the kind of civics ed education that we've seen, you know, maybe in past in schools is not quite there anymore. So it's up to you if you have kids to educate them as well and make sure they understand their rights. You know, I, I have a, a good example of before, you know, the election, uh, my daughter, I don't realize how much she's picking up in my car when I'm listening to podcasts. And she was watching YouTube on, on her tablet one day and, and she's like, Ugh, Joe Biden. Like there's just a Joe Biden commercial. It's like, oh, we don't like Joe Biden. Like, then she sees Joe Biden signs up, you know, by the neighbor's house. You're like, oh, we don't like them because they like Joe Biden. And, you know, I have to explain to her like, no, we don't dislike people because they like or they're voting for someone else different than we are. People have different ideas and that's okay. If you think your ideas are better, argue with them and say, these are why my ideas are better. But in the end, we're both we're neighbors at the end of the day and you have to treat them with respect. And I think that's something that's kind of lost on all of us lately because politics has become a sport uh, where you pick your team and you just avidly root for them and you, you very, very much dislike the other team. So I think it's important to, yeah. it begins with education and then adding on to the culture. You know, you have to be able to, to, to be willing to affect culture in a way that you see a lot of the people on the left doing, but hopefully in a more or less violent way, I, I would say than, than they're doing sometimes, but you have to find ways to, to push your principles and say, this is why I believe it. Uh, this is why, you know, my, my, party is not based on racism or I don't want to go back to slavery or Jim Crow or stuff like this when I'm advocating for the, the certain policies that I want. But it's up to you to find different ways to ingrain that in the culture and, you know, again, be the change you want to be or, or more, if you don't want to be changed, if you want to conserve something, uh, explain the principles as to why you should maintain this specific policy or, or view or political view. And so if you come away with anything on this podcast, don't worry about uh, how you label the definitions, but worry about uh, becoming more active and, and understanding, you know, what you believe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really uh, feel what you just said. And to me, that is what it, 
that is very much what it means to be a progressive traditionalist in a lot of ways. And I, I just want to, I want to bring up sort of the things that really inspired me to create this definition, um, which was I initially made my locals almost immediately after uh, this viral rant that Tim Pool made on his on his live stream. Uh, I think it was in May or June, early June of this year, where he blew up uh, about how he gets so pissed that the left keeps pulling the culture in one direction, and all the right does is they sit there polite and they don't. They don't make any arguments. They don't go out and protest. They're not doing anything. They're not being politically active. And when I saw, when I heard that rant uh, that he made, and, and and I highly recommend looking it up. J- just search Tim Pool rant, and you should be able to find it. Hopefully, um, or Tim Pool explodes, something like that. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure. I'm sure it'll come up. It was a really long, just just him going at it. Uh, it's the most of upset I've ever seen the guy, at least. And um, I remember shortly after that, I was going, I made my uh, channel here, com- I made Commutation Construct, and I really started getting into it. And I went on to Dave Rubin's, uh, ch- I went on to Dave Rubin's uh, locals community, I went to his, his website and started talking to people in the comments there. And when I was talking to people about sort of, oh, we should uh, maybe take a little bit more action, we should speak up more and defend our defend our traditional values and whatnot and from multiple people i was in dave rubin's community mind you this is a community that's dave rubin's whole thing is talking to people and this community his community his supporters in his community the only ones who can are the only ones who can comment they're the people who actually pay him for what he does and they're telling me no 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 all i need to do is vote all that matters is the vote. And to me, that is the difference between, that is a real difference between progressive and traditionalists. Progressives, they're political, or traditional, or conservatives, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting my own words mixed up now. Conservatives, uh, their, their political action starts and ends at the ballot box. Progressives bring it beyond that. that that's kind of the, a way that I think people can really look at it. And I think that's re- that's a really important note to take home because currently, and, and we are seeing more of it on the we are seeing more of that progressive action on the right side. We're seeing the people getting out there and doing their doing their events. You, you see it with Walk Away. You see it with the March for Trump uh, on the day we're recording this. Actually, I believe just you see it with Trump's rallies. People just going out, cheering, hammering away at what they believe in and that is really important because the right has basically not done that for generations at this point uh so there's always been that pull on the left now we're finally getting that tug back on the right and i think that's really important uh the trouble is if it you don't want it to you don't want the whole country to split apart from being pulled on both ends so but you do want it pulled on both ends that way you find the right – that way you really get the good alignment. It's like driving with two hands on the wheel. <laughs> yeah, you need um, that equal and opposite tension there in order to, to maintain equilibrium. So I think it's very important. Exactly. Uh, any, anyone listening to this, uh, let us know in the comments. What, what phrase would you prefer to use? Conservatism, progressive, traditionalism? Do you use your own phrase? Uh, you know, how, how do you like to describe – whether it be yourself, I'm not saying that all of you are conservatives or, or progressive traditionalists, but uh, even let us know, how would you describe your own political ideology? And it'd be really interesting to, to have us follow up and, and maybe it'll uh, start up another conversation between you and I. So that'd be pretty cool if you guys do that. Uh, before we leave, what is the next thing you're working on? Next thing I'm working on? Uh, well, I've got a couple surprise projects on the way that I'm working on. Uh, but for the most part, I'm continuing my work going through the Federalist Papers. I, I'm reading through one Federalist paper and one anti-Federalist paper every week. I am going through speeches, uh, one historical speech every week where I orate it. Uh, I don't read through them first, so sometimes it's a little I, – I, my oration isn't always the best. But I, I orate through the speech, and then I go back, and I'll talk a bit about some of my thoughts on it. It's, it's, it's not really a full analysis. It's just kind of a light uh, – conversation type of thing like oh this is a cool speech but um 
I do that, and I, I've got my regular show, the Construct Cast, every every Saturday at three fifteen p.m. because YouTube doesn't let me upload directly at three. <laughs> Nice. All right, man. Uh, I will definitely plug your stuff after the podcast, but uh, again, main spot to, to find you at commentationconstructs.locals.com. Make sure to support you yep. there. Uh, you can find all the podcasts there. And with that, man, you're definitely going to be coming back on soon, I hope. And uh, everyone, thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you. All right, there it is. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Make sure to join the Commutation Construct Locals community and show James some support. You can go to commutationconstruct.locals.com to support his locals community. And you can also find him on YouTube by searching Commutation Construct and find him on Twitter at Commutation C. And as I said at the beginning of the show, I want to take a quick moment to share different ways you can help support this content. There are a few easy ways to do this. You can follow me on Twitter at ENG underscore politics. You can give me a follow on Parlor at Engineering Politics. You can join the Facebook group named Engineering Politics, where I share and discuss content with the Facebook community. You can also subscribe to my video channel on YouTube under the name Engineering Politics, where you can find the video version of each podcast. I'm also active on ThinkSpot, which is a discourse-generating application that promotes intelligent and honest conversations while discouraging the trolling and nonsense found on most social media platforms. You can find all my podcasts and videos on there as well. And now there's a new donation feature on the ThinkSpot page for those of you who follow me on there and want to support this content. But the best way to interact with me, get my newest content, and support this podcast is the Engineering Politics Locals community. This is an amazing community that goes far beyond just a membership platform intermediary for creators. It allows the followers of this content to get together and discuss the newest articles, podcasts, and videos all in one place. I strongly urge you to join the Engineering Politics Locals community at engineeringpolitics.locals.com. You can become a member for free, and now you can get a three-month free trial when becoming a subscriber if you use promo code EPFREE. That's spelled E-P-F-R-E-E, -E, no spaces. I would love to have your support with your subscription so this content can remain independent and keep growing. Monthly subscriptions to the Engineering Politics Locals Community start as low as $2 per month. I hope I can count on your support so I can continue making high-quality podcasts and subscriber content. I appreciate your consideration. Let's build a community together. Thanks for listening. This is the Engineering Politics Podcast. None of the persons, podcasts, books, or other references other than engineering politics used in this work directly reflect my ideas and or personal beliefs, nor should they be held accountable for anything said during this podcast. Thank you for listening.